What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Brown Girl Green. I'm your host, Christy Drutman, where I interview environmental leaders and advocates about the importance of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, as well as creative solutions to the climate crisis. I am so excited to be joined by my friend here, and I love having friends on the podcast, who is going <laughs> to talk about her brilliant work in climate tech and helping BIPOC folks be able to get their bag and make an impact too. And we're mm-hmm. going to be talking about that in today's episode around the concept of climate tech, about intergenerational wealth and climate activism. So I'm so happy to have her on and I would love for you to introduce yourself to the audience. Ah, so good. I'm so happy to be here and love this podcast. So I can't wait to, to be a part of it. My name is Kylan aiken Zerby. I'm the head of growth at Planet Forward. We're the leading climate management solution for consumer companies. And we'll get into all the different things about my background, but really at the core, I'm an impact oriented woman who cares about trying to build a better future for all of us, especially people of color, especially people who have been disenfranchised and left out of that narrative and have brought that into every aspect of my work since day one and will continue to. And I'm so happy to be here to get word out about all the different ways that we can do that. No, that's perfect. So, you know, we started hinting at it, but I want you to walk us through your journey around being in the climate space. I know that this wasn't originally where you started off, and I think your story is really interesting, where you were able to be able to transition into more of a climate role and in the environmental space. Can you walk us a bit through your passion for the environment and how that translated into your career journey? Yeah, absolutely. I think honestly, to explain my journey, you have to take it back to day one. My parents actually met at Earth Day in Santa Barbara. My dad was a musician and my mom was just a crazy little hippie girl. (laughs) And so in a lot of ways, I think that my path was kind of predetermined. But I grew up with a lot of kind of hardships that come from growing up in a low-income family with really young parents and grew up homeless and in a lot of different situations that lent itself to really like school and my pursuits being the way out of that. And that's the case for a, a lot of people from where I'm from. And so I've always been an impact oriented person, I think kind of due to that upbringing when we talk about topics like environmental justice and the importance of that, like the fact that I grew up in California and had access to the ocean and to the mountains, despite having really, you know, unsecure, oftentimes home living spaces, that wasn't a huge deal. That's not the case for a lot of people if you grow up in the inner city and in places where you don't have that. And so that's always been a passion area of mine. I got into college on a full ride scholarship as a Gates Scholar, which was a huge just unlock in terms of opportunity for me. And I majored in environment, economics, and politics, really with this idea behind it that the the leaders of our future are going to be people who understand that the biggest issues we're facing today, whether that be climate or poverty or world hunger, are intersectional issues. You can't solve climate change through only science or through only economics Mm -hmm. or only policy. It's all of it, right? And so that's really kind of like, you know, where my thinking came from. I went directly into the investment space after college, but still with an impact lens. I was one of the first employees for a firm called Milk Partners. We led kind of the rise of ESG investment, which is environmental, social, and governance investment across the private equity space. And I always viewed myself while there as a translator because I'm like a toes in the dirt type of girl in terms of just my core. But it's places like the investment world and the private sector where this needs to be translated into terms that people are going to understand. Like, how does the fact that we're not preserving the environment and valuing labor and all of these issues, how does that translate into the fact that your company might be more at risk of failure in the future? Because that's mismanagement. All of these things that, you know, just the link hadn't been drawn before. And that's a lot of what I did there. So that was kind of the early part of my career. I was the head of venture capital and growth equity for Malk and and built the ESG programs for top funds across the US and Europe. And just to make this super (laughs) clear, like a lot of this was me figuring it out. You know, I was super young. I was, I was the only black woman in rooms. I was the only 
woman in a lot of rooms. And so there was a lot of crap. I don't know what's going on here, but like, let me, let me figure it out kind of a thing. Yeah. And, and I think the more and more spaces I started to occupy and the more big rooms I ended up being in, I'm like, mm, I don't know that anyone knows much more than me either. So. <laughs> true. Right. And that's the truth. And so through that journey, I had the privilege of being introduced to Julia Collins, who was the first black woman to found a unicorn. And she at the time was starting a company called Planet Forward. This was like very early stages, seed stage funding idea phase of the company. There wasn't like a true software yet. And so I came on board with her with the idea of building out this carbon accounting solution, uh, which I recognized through my role in the investment world was just needed. I, I was doing that type of work for companies. And every single time I got into a conversation with an investor around how to start to scale their climate action programs and do this across their portfolios, they're like, okay, like what is the software solution that could do it? And I was like, ah, can't lie. Don't know that there's a good one out there yet. <laughs> So when Julia said she wanted to build one, I was game. And so now I lead growth for Planet Forward. We're post Series A. We raised over $15 million in funding. And our Yeah. Amazing. (laughs) Um, That's amazing. And on the path to to really be be a huge company, not only in terms of the revenue that we bring in and the customers we're able to sign, but also in the impact that we're able to have. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, your CV is nothing short of absolutely (laughs) mind blowing. But, you know, a lot of people have been throwing around the term climate tech and a lot of people don't necessarily know like what that means. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. in your own words, how do you define climate tech? I have my own definition. but I'm just curious. how, How do you define where climate tech is in this moment? Yeah, yeah, I know. I don't necessarily know that I have like a in quotes definition, but to me, it's any, (laughs) any technology solution. And and we say when we say technology, I would just say it's any innovation that serves the purpose of fighting climate change, and making a positive impact on achieving climate goals. And one of my favorite quotes, I actually don't remember exactly who it's from. So apologies. But it's this idea, he says that, the biggest impact that climate tech or or technology is going to have on fighting the climate crisis is not some sort of crazy quote unquote technology. It's not going to be a rocket. It's not going to be some crazy carbon capture technology. It's applying mindsets of scalability to Mm -hmm. the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And that's what technology does really well. It innovates to make things more efficient, makes them more accessible, makes them easier to do at scale across more companies, more people, bigger companies. And scalability lends itself to speed. And so that's really what I think climate tech is today is any company that's out there that is speeding up our ability through some sort of innovation to fight the climate crisis. And why do you feel like investment in tech is like an interesting tool for climate advocacy? You know, I hear a lot of times from climate activists in this space where it's something Mm -hmm. like, oh, if you're going to even think about investing your money, that's antithetical to addressing the climate crisis because you're just like a capitalist and you're not thinking about things, you're not vetting, you're just contributing to the problem. What are your thoughts Mm -hmm. on that? Just to start off with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, just transparently, I think the idea that we have to fight against capitalism and the like underpinning ideals that have driven capitalism for so long do need to be assessed and they do need to be reimagined and they do need to be rethought and reapplied 100%. However, it's not a binary. It's not like take down capitalism and then fight the climate crisis. We don't have that type of time and we don't have that type of privilege. And so we have to be changing the system through the system at the same time that we're doing all of that assessment and reimagining. And so uh, investment is not contrary to progress in the directions that we need to get it to. In fact, I believe that it's 100% necessary to actually build a company, to build an organization, to build movements, to build anything does take money in this world. And until that's 
not the case, investment is a core aspect of the ability of anyone to be able to do that. Because it's not going to be the case that builders of color and BIPOC communities necessarily have thousands or millions of dollars to do the things that they want to do sitting in their bank account. But it is the case that foundations have that money and impact investors have that money and high net worth individuals that want to make investments in things that are quote unquote bigger than themselves have that money. And so that in itself is redistribution of capital. That And that is one of the tools that we have readily available to do that. And so I'm a yeah. huge proponent of it. And I think it just comes down to us making sure that that capital gets into the right hands and that we also start to think critically about who we're making money for when it comes to investment, because that's a big piece of it as well, right? If we, if investors are all coming from the same white entrenched families and, and then invest in the innovations that are built by communities of color, but that only continues to increase the wealth gap, that's also not helpful. And so one thing we did with Planet Forward Julia intentionally raised our seed round from women founded and BIPOC founded or managed investors to really start that conversation as well. Like, how are we thinking about who we're making money for? So it's complicated to say the least, but I think that when it comes to being able to make progress as fast as we need to, we have to use all the tools we have. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I think with, me beginning my journey also as a startup founder in the climate tech space with Green Jobs Board, it's been such a whirlwind to enter into a space that feels very foreign and different than what I'm used to from coming from like, you know, a a youth activist background, even climate scientist background, and even a content creator, quote unquote, influencer background. Now entering the climate tech space, it's very white, it's very male, it's very inaccessible. And so Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering like, and I didn't know that you all mostly tap into women and BIPOC funds. I Like, that's so sick. I'm just wondering, like, how have you been able to navigate that? Like, I know it's not like an easy answer, but it just seems really complicated. And I obviously you said that you were the only black women woman in a lot of these rooms early on in social mm-hmm. impact capital. Like, what did you see back then compared to like what's happening now, especially like in a post 2020 George Floyd moment are you actually seeing like that more of those funds are flowing to BIPOC communities like have there been more of these BIPOC and woman funds popping up to combat some of like that lack of diversity inclusion I'm just wondering what have you noticed over your years of being in this work yeah well I'll say first of all the like getting used to being in white spaces started far before private equity right like i went to a predominantly white institution i was one of i think less than 20 black people in my graduating class in college so i got used to operating in white spaces pretty quick <laughs> yeah. um and and i think that there was important lessons even back then right like i remember being in my college dorm i was in a triple my freshman year and bless their hearts, love them. But like my two girls that I was living with had a conversation one night about vacation homes. And that was like mm-hmm. the conversation of the night. And I'm sitting here in my top bunk, like, ha 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 ha. I have one bedroom and <laughs> one bathroom in my home or two bedrooms and one bathroom in my home that I've lived in with my whole family, you know? And yeah. so So that was a really important lesson, actually, because that is Mm -hmm. what continues to happen over and over and over again in terms of what it means to be able to navigate in these rooms and spaces. It's Mm -hmm. really, can you figure out how to connect with people who might not have come from the same background as you or have the same values or same network or same circle on anything? And that's Mm -hmm. just a a superpower that I built over time is really Mm -hmm. the power of relationship building. And so I want to just say that because like sometimes it's it's like soft skills that also really, really matter in how you can be successful. So have I seen things change? Yes and no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was in private equity during the kind of rise up of Black Lives Matter after George Floyd was murdered. <clears throat> and I actually worked specifically on initiatives to get more dollars allocated to managers of color 
in response to that, that was one of the initiatives I started at our firm coming out of it because I was just angry. I was just pissed off and like to not be able to do anything about it was not an option for me. Yeah. And so, but at the end of the day, like the numbers for funding going towards women of color are not budging much. In fact, I think they actually decreased this year as opposed to the year prior. And so, and there's still sub, sub 2% of funding goes to women of, of color founders. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's increasing. Yes. We have more funds popping up that are focused on this, but at the, but I'm going to be very honest with the fact that like, it's still very hard and it's really a function of some of those soft skills that I think are the differentiators. Mm -hmm. Once you get to Mm -hmm. a place where you have your idea and you have your, your deck together and you're ready to go pitch and you're ready to go share with the world, you have to learn how to build relationships because at the end of the day, that's still the golden rule is network and introductions. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about all the systems that exist and all the accelerators and all of those things. And I'm happy to list those, (laughs) but, and they're helpful. Don't get me wrong, but you have to be able to meet the people that are going to be able to open doors for you. And you have to be able to connect with them when you have the opportunities to and that comes from a place of us building confidence in ourselves building confidence in each other sharing our experiences with each other like I I think that this is a very from the ground up type of movement still (laughs) yeah I agree I think a lot of it people think oh okay there's some like silver bullet or like there's some back door that like we just need to like search for it. And I think that's not even the case. It's a matter of like being able to build those networks and finding your allies and your co-conspirators to be able to Mm -hmm. find those back doors and build those roadmaps because no one has built that for us. And I think Mm -hmm. especially when it comes to getting funded, when it comes to climate tech or trying to build a climate solution that requires things like venture capital funding or like being able to get grants or or crowdfund whatever, that requires things like credibility, that requires Mm -hmm. trust, that requires reputation. All of those Mm -hmm. things are very embedded in access to intergenerational wealth, privilege, higher education, and, and just like access right and so it's like Mm -hmm. if you don't have any of those things you have to build those things or find mentors or find support networks to resource that right because that's unfortunately how these things are built and we weren't Mm -hmm. born with those things we weren't born Mm -hmm. even knowing these things so the only way we can bring more BIPOC into these rooms sure like you said there are accelerators which I am going to have you list some awesome resources (laughs) after this Um, There there are great programs, right? But what I'm even learning as a at the very beginning of this journey of we don't have any friends and family funds. I learned that this past year that there's friends and family funds. I'm like, my friends and family can maybe buy me a coffee, maybe Venmo me for a (laughs) sandwich. They're not going to be able to, they're not going to drop 25 grand on my company. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, yeah, I don't just, a I don't small loan of a million dollars. <laughs> like, okay, yeah, yeah. A small yeah, loan no of a million dollars from my parents, <laughs> from my dad, you know, whatever. I wish. So it's just one of those things where it's like we have to be really honest that like we we can obviously build trust with some of those existing infrastructures and you know obviously funds that are run mostly by white folks who do come from that kind of wealth and access and at the Mm -hmm. same time also build networks and support communities where we're teaching each other hey these are the grants i applied to these are the incubators i trust that angel investor i don't trust that person you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. and that requires Mm -hmm. like people looking out for each other and that requires us also challenging scarcity mindset right that's something Mm -hmm. that i think a lot of us who grew up as children of immigrants or as by like young bipoc a lot of us grew up instilled with this idea of scarcity mindset because of the systems that our parents were put through that forced them to be frugal right that forced them to like not have that kind of access so then we live in that same way where it's like we feel like we can't ask for raises Mm -hmm. to negotiate Mm -hmm. for more money from our employer, mm-hmm. we feel like we can't ask for funding for the initiatives and programs we want because either we'll get rejected or we don't know how who those people are. And three, mm-hmm. like we just don't even know where to look in the first place to find that funding right. because most of right. the people that are in that are in these backdoor closed rooms, right? So I just appreciate everything you just said about like those soft skills because everything I've been able to build to be this quote unquote successful 
it's been mm-hmm. because of relationships. So I love oh, that yeah. you brought that up as well. Um, so um, yeah, 100%. let's dive a little bit deeper into that with like, what were some of the key relationships with like Planet Forward or even, yeah, like with your own work that you felt were like really like fundamental to you thriving in the climate tech space? A hundred percent. Wow. This is going to get like soft and squishy. <laughs> Um, I love it. No, please. (laughs) So, I mean, first of all, Julia Collins, she's the founder of Planet Forward. And she, actually, I'm going to rewind a little bit, even before Planet Forward to like some like really important people. The founders of my previous firm, Mulk Partners, Andrew Mulk, and then Ryan Miller, who built that alongside him, were both white men. But they were challenging the status quo by starting an ESG fund, and they really did work to embody the like ideals that they were trying to push forward for other firms. And one of my, actually my first meeting I ever had with Ryan Miller, this was my first week of work at Malk. I walked into his office and I asked him very straight up, and this is a memory I remember really viscerally. I was... 22, right out of college, like ambitious as hell, <laughs> uh, but but had no idea how any of this worked and had no idea what was going to get me to where I wanted to be. I'd taken my first step, but I did not know what the next 10 were from that point forward. But I did know that I needed to understand what was going to work right there in that moment with those people back to this idea of relationship. And so my first ever meeting with Ryan Miller at the end of it, he said, do you have any questions for me? And I asked him straight up. I was like, Ryan, I can walk into this office every day and I can be buttoned up, suit jacket on, handle my shit, like run it up on calls with clients, like do everything extremely well and walk out. That's a version of me that can exist. Or I can do all of those things and I can dance through the hallways sometimes and I can be loud and I can be a little crazy, but I need you to tell me right now which of those versions of Kylan you want because I can be either. I know which one will make me happier, but I need to know which one will be rewarded. And he told me, he's like, we hired you for all of those reasons, but also because of the energy that you bring into spaces when you show up. Like, we need that. that that's an, mm-hmm. an intangible. and. That, like, at the end of the day, it is not anyone else's job to give you permission to be yourself. But at that stage in my career and in my journey of becoming a young professional woman, that was a really big deal to me. Mm -hmm. And I've taken that with me every step of the way forward, where I recognize that, like, my energy and the way I show up and who I am is a differentiator for me as as a person. And shout out Ryan Miller. (laughs) And then Julia huge a huge just inspiration to me always but a huge and important connection in my career and and professional journey I was at a crossroads in my career when I met her I was either going to stay at Malk which would have been great or I was going to go build the ESG program for Vista Equity Partners which is one of the top PE funds started by Robert Smith who's the wealthiest black man in the world or I was going to go start this seed stage like new, fresh, nothing yet to prove that it's going to be successful other than this woman company with Julia. Mm. And I took a huge risk at that point in time in my career, but Mm. it was truly the fact that she made me feel on fire internally Mm. that, that made me want to do that. I was like, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that I feel alive here. And so I'm going to go do that. And the permission to continue to be myself through that has just tremendously grown. I have to give a shout out to Shante Harris. She's my best friend, yeah. but also an incredible Black woman in the climate tech space. We started the climate tech room together on Clubhouse during the pandemic. And I remember calling her up. We, I was like, hey, we, we were always in these investor rooms and venture capital rooms and all these things. We were always the ones talking about climate within those spaces, but there wasn't a dedicated space to talk about climate within a business setting. And so I called her. I was like, hey, I'm pretty sure we got like two weeks until a white man does this. You going to do it with me or not? <laughs> I was like, because the last thing I want is to have to show up to somebody else's room and do the things that we know that we could have done better. 
And she did that alongside me and we grew it to be the largest online community during the pandemic focused on climate tech and solutions and centering conversations on equity and all the things that matter to us, solutions oriented thinking. And so to have her in my corner constantly as a like true best friend, but also ally within this space has been so incredible. We go to COP together. We go to the White House and the UN and all of these like huge places that we have to operate professionally. But to have that level of like, I see you with somebody so close to me within those spaces gives me strength that I think is is unheard of. I'll stop, but I could go down this list forever. Other people, Chad Frischman, the one of the original builders of Project Drawdown, is an incredible friend, mentor, door opener, supporter of mine. Sam Cass, who's one of our investors, our lead investor at Planet Forward. He was somebody that I met through network prior to him coming on to building our company, but he's one, been one of the biggest door openers for us when it comes to customer conversations and being someone who really champions us mm-hmm. on some of the biggest stages in the world. And that matters, right? Like, it's not just like, oh, you know, can can you give me capital? It's also like, are you really in this with me? And he's shown up in that way for Julia and I. So I could go down this list forever, but it's been a lot of impactful people. <laughs> No, no, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I would love, yeah, I think everything you described, there's like different categories of people that fulfill different roles when it comes to having a successful climate tech operation. Because I think obviously you need people that know the science and have Mm -hmm. the background in climate to really understand and measure the impact you're trying to make. I think that's one piece of it. Then what I'm hearing is there's also the piece of people who are willing to champion what you're doing so you can continue to demonstrate that impact as well as get into rooms um, to demonstrate that impact. And then I think lastly, it's like these support networks, these people that can provide both emotional support, professional support, so on and so forth to be able to keep you afloat when things can feel up and down, especially when you're still trying to as they say, you climb up one mountain and then there's another mountain. I feel like that's a lot of what happens in the climate tech space where even though like there's tons of capital that is inflowing, like there's mil- trillions of dollars that's estimated to go into the climate tech space in the coming century. Again, we have to think about how is that even getting distributed? What kind of projects are getting prioritized? And what I find really amazing about Planet Forward is that it is like, black woman owned, like led, like, like driven, you know what I mean? And I think that that there's something about that that's very magical in the face of the numbers of knowing that there's all this doubt, can women of color be good founders? Can they get the funding? Can they secure it? Can they scale? And you all are just like, yeah, we did it. And we're doing it well, (laughs) we're doing it better than you. Um, which I love. And so, (laughs) yeah, no, for real. And so, Could you talk a little bit more about like the impact of like, like why is this platform so important? Why is, why is a tool like what you all are building so necessary for addressing climate change right now? In the odds of everything that you were saying previously about women of color, like not getting funding, you all did secure funding because what you're building clearly has a demonstrable impact. I just wanted to know if you could talk a little bit more about that impact and like, Were there major challenges to demonstrate that to people, to prove that validity, or because of those relationships you all built, do you feel like that really, I don't know, maybe made it easier for you than maybe compared to some other women of color founders? Mm. I'm just curious from what you experienced. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think that the impact that Planet Forward creates and the business model we're able to support are due to each other. And so we found a really big need <laughs> within a really big market and and set out to solve that. So just to put some kind of you know numbers and size to that, we set out explicitly to solve the climate related challenges of consumer companies. So mm. food and bev, beauty, personal care, fashion, C- the consumer industry in terms of like products that people purchase, use, consume, throw away drives 45% of global emissions. Food alone is a third of global emissions. 
But that makes sense when you think about the fact that we eat every single day, we wear clothes, we buy things, we see trash cans fill up over and over and over and over again, right? Like that's a huge aspect of what's driving the climate crisis. And obviously there's all the raw material extraction to make that happen. And then all of the supply chains that are operating globally in order to make it super easy to buy something on Amazon every day, right? Mm -hmm. So... That's what Planet Forward set out to solve. And our big innovation is around scope three measurement in particular, which is the ability to measure the impact of all of the things in your supply chain that you as a consumer company either purchase or create. And Mm -hmm. we do that because we have the largest life cycle assessment database for agricultural production systems and really advanced value chain modeling tools, which means if you are Walmart, for example, and you carry thousands and thousands of brands across thousands and thousands of locations around the world, you don't know the impact of every single thing that you're purchasing, and therefore you definitely don't know how you could reduce those emissions. But -hmm. Planet Forward has that data. And so we help the Walmarts, for example, measure their carbon footprint of their full business to decarbonize it, reduce the emissions related to it. And what we're really doing that's incredible is we're creating an ecosystem of data where Mm. once we have all the brands on the platform, once we have all the suppliers, once we have all the retailers, now everyone has access to each other's climate related information. And that's what we need to be able to really move fast. So Mm. that's kind of what our, that's our vision. That's what we're building towards. That's what we're doing. And one of the things that's important about how we built the company is that we asked companies what they needed. We Mm. were part of Elemental Accelerator, which is one of those resources that I highly recommend in terms of accelerators. They have a whole diversity and equity program, which is extremely impactful. And they think about that really critically in the way that they run their their program. And we went out and talked to like hundreds and hundreds of companies around what they needed. We didn't think in our heads like, oh, we're so smart. We know exactly what they need. We're like, why we need to go ask them. And I think that in itself is like a framework and a way to approach building businesses that is also not the status quo. I mean, you know, Mm. non-diverse founders you see all the time, like I know everything. I have the solutions for everyone, even if I'm not everyone. And that's not how we approach things. So Long story short is that we built a solution that was really needed by a really big market, and that lent itself to us having a highly investable business. We could prove that there was billions and billions of dollars flowing into the the problem that we were trying to solve, and that kind of the rule in SaaS is if you can even solve, if you can make something even, you know, like basically if you can make it 90% more efficient, then you can like, capture the value of that. So mm. we, we did, we, we did well, but fundraising was hard still. Fundraising is still super, super hard. I think in general, like climate tech is still a pretty new and emerging space. And so markets don't move as quickly as they do in some other places when it comes yeah. to like actually purchasing a software for climate tech, for example, oftentimes like you're building the demand for that as you're trying to build your company. And so there was a lot of challenges. There's a lot of challenges probably related to being women and all and all of those different things. But at the end of the day, our fundamentals were strong. We had a strong solution that's solving a huge problem for a huge market. And that's what investors are looking for. No, that's really helpful to just like walk through that and understand, especially that you all did your research, you know, it was not, it wasn't you like coming in. And I see that honestly, a lot sometimes in climate tech Mm -hmm. specifically, because it is very much about like, save the planet or changing Mm -hmm. the world. And there can be a lot of like, misdirected ego sometimes that I can feel like obviously people have good intentions but I think they're not actually understanding about like the scalability and also like how the market currently operates with like Mm -hmm. the solution that they're building and so it's really great that you all were able to plug that in and make it translatable you know you previously mentioned there's accelerators and programs that you think do exist out there that can be supportive especially for maybe some BIPOC and women who want to get into the space. What are some of your recommendations on resources for that? 100%. So I think that there's really like three different things that are extremely important within this. The first is just awareness building from the get-go in terms of getting the word out there about like what types of roles that you can have, like where you can find them, what things are even 
available to build within climate tech. I think just like seeing more um, examples of other companies that other people have built and especially other founders of color have built is one of the best places for people to just either feel more you know, sure of themselves and what they're going to go forward with or get into the space and get experience before you go off and build for yourself. So obviously things like the Green Jobs Board, super huge for that. Like podcasts like this, super huge for that. I remember when I was in college, I had no idea that social impact or, or social innovation was a thing. It wasn't until, you know, a class that brought in different entrepreneurs, um, kind of opened my mind to the fact that you could make money and solve problems at the same time. You didn't have to be inherently evil to make money, which was definitely like an idea that I grew up with that I had to shed. So <clears throat> I think that to begin with is so, so big. Another place that people don't always think to look is um, venture capital funds always post the jobs that are available in for their startups on their pages. And so if there's like a VC that's focused on climate tech, sometimes there'll even be like entrepreneur in residence programs or people looking for co-founders. So those are also re really, really great, great places to look for things. And then once you actually have an idea <laughs> and you're building it, then you need funding and you need a team and you need customers. And so I think that Accelerators like Elemental, which we were a part of, which I could not sing higher praises for, are so important. They have an equity and access program as part of Elemental. They, to this day, are one of our just greatest allies in the world, like make, making customer intros to us. They spun out a fund called Earthshot Ventures, which now does direct investment into Elemental companies as well and, and more broadly. So they're incredible. The Emerson Collective is another just really great ally of ours, and they have everything from first gen intern programs to getting people exposure to climate tech from like high school and college age through being, you know, huge just allies all the way through our process, you know, post series A, series B for the long haul. And then there's all other things. There's something called the Equity Alliance, which is an incredible group of venture capital funds focused on getting more capital to founders of color. Concrete Rose is a part of that. Upfront Ventures is another incredible fund. It's really focused on Black founders. And then even programs like Google for Startups. If you can apply to some of these programs and get into them, they have like an explicit program focused on Black founders. I had never done sales before in my life, and I'm head of growth for a, a Series A climate tech company that's growing very fast. And one of the sessions that Julia and I did together through Google for Startups years back was B2B sales. And we went through like a full boot camp on how to effectively navigate B2B sales for enterprise SaaS solutions through Google for Startups. And that was a really helpful program for us. So, and I think another thing that's important is also thinking about what you need most in each moment because another problem is just like being inundated with all of these resources and spending your time in places that you actually shouldn't be when you should really be focused on building your company so also recognizing and having a really strong prioritization process as to what you need and who's best suited to help you with that yeah no that's that's really helpful I think there is a lot of like times when people get really caught in having a lot of great conversations and relationship building. And sometimes that's good. But if you're not actually like strategic on like what those relationships are and what you're cultivating, that it kind of, yeah, you can get burnt out really quickly and not actually mm -hmm. be the most effective with like time and resources. So mm -hmm. I think that's really useful, climate tech or not. Like that's just good mm -hmm. advice in life. In totally, totally. And, Our uh, time is so valuable. Yeah, no, 100%. And so, you know, I would also say like, Going back to this whole thing about markets and capital and this difficulty, especially when you come from maybe an immigrant household where you might have some things like scarcity mindset, not being mm -hmm. able to mm -hmm. think, you know, gaining things like wealth are, is like allowed for you or like that that's mm -hmm. like an okay thing to do, especially if you're like in the social impact space. Like mm -hmm. how did you kind of work through maybe some shame or guilt around scarcity or like money trauma and realize that like you deserve those resources mm -hmm. oh my gosh it is still something I'm trying to unpack to this day like 100 percent I, I grew up super poor the number one like cause of fights in my household growing up was money and and because of that 
like everything I've ever received, quote unquote, because I should really say earned, not received, right? Like I earned everything I have. I've worked very hard for it. And so even even moving away from a like I'm receiving or I'm taking or I'm being given to just like I'm earning, I deserve, I have created this value actually, are things that I'm still working on really, really actively. And to be clear, I think that this is like a lifelong journey. Like some of the things that are ingrained in us, we have to really like unpack forever. But one thing that's been helpful for me is actually to think like I'm somebody else. It's really hard for me to ask for things for myself. It's really hard for me to advocate for myself. I will tell myself all of the reasons that I don't deserve something or whatever it is before I will like strongly advocate for why I do. Mm-hmm. And that's something, again, to unlearn. Like I'm being super transparent. That's very hard. But I also recognize like I joke all the time about having the audacity of a white man because (laughs) that's really what it comes down to. It's like when you've grown up believing something is for you, you don't ever question it and you ask for way more than I ever would, right? And so when I was really early on in my career, I actually was brought into our, our office by our partner. He gave me a raise and he told me, I'm just gonna be super honest with you. One of your like counterparts, which were all white men, so he didn't need to say that, <laughs> asked for this and and made the case for it and advocated for it. And I thought in my head, hmm, Kylan actually works harder than this person. Kylan actually produces more than this person. Perhaps she deserves a raise too. But that level of advocacy is not something that is common or that I could ever expect anyone else to ever do for me ever again. And yeah. so that was kind of eye opening for me at that stage that like I'm I'm worth it and I'm not asking for it. And it's still yeah. something that that I struggle with. But I think if you can put yourself into someone else's shoes, like what would you ask this person? Like what what do you think this person would deserve if they did all the same yeah. things as you? Sometimes that helps us detach ourselves from all of the like traumas and ideas and like deeply ingrained beliefs that we might have that we're trying to work through and just see something objectively and yeah I think that's one of the things like from a very personal how to do it standpoint that's been helpful for me yeah no that's really helpful I would say like it's just so discouraging when you hear that like such a small amount of funding is specifically going to like BIPOC period, especially women of color. And then when you look Mm -hmm. at like climate and those Mm -hmm. numbers, it's like abysmally small, right? Mm -hmm. Even within Mm -hmm. that, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the statistics, it can make you feel pretty pessimistic to feel Mm -hmm. like, why even do this when like, you know, it's statistically the odds are against me to even get funding for these solutions. But I think what those of us who are, you know, young people of color, especially who are like emerging in the space and coming up with solutions and finding those intersections between, you know, tech, finance, and like climate. I think we have to realize that like we're building things that just have never existed before or they existed mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. roots of our ancestors, but due to all of these things that like ripped our communities away from these solutions and from access to this capital that would benefit our communities. It's like, we have to think about that. Like there's reasons why we even have a climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And it's because a lot of the money and power and decision-making was put into the hands of people that were focused on exploitation and destruction. Mm -hmm. And so for those of us who at least have the intention of not being that, and yeah. want to build solutions that we believe if we're able to scale it up to an extent, which I would say that our scalability for some of us is not to the extent of these like billionaires destroying the planet by any mm-hmm. means. Like I realized that the other day, I was like, oh, like even wanting to ask for X amount of money or having X amount of like maybe income, I felt so guilty about that. I'm like, actually that's only the fraction of a oh, penny yeah. of a billionaire's wallet, right? Exactly. That like I even want. Or how much money I even want my company to have. You know what I mean? It's oh, like, absolutely. I'm not trying to be a behemoth. And it's just funny because sometimes in these social impact spaces, it's like, oh, well, the fact that you even want to even grow that much or even have that is like, there's something 
evil about that because then you're no better than those people. And it's like, we have to put things in scales, like realistic scaling of hierarchies of how this actually operates for scalable solutions. And I think that's something that that language needs to needs to work. We need to work it, on that. It needs to shift. And also we have to remember that in a capitalist system and society, money is the reward for being successful. And if your core concept idea and business is built on creating positive outcomes for the environment and people, and therefore you make money being successful in doing that, you are solving the problem. Like you are doing the thing. Like that's just the way that our, our system works. And so that also just needs to be remembered. And I think another thing that was that you had just mentioned was this idea of like statistics and the odds and like why should I even try when it's only you know less than two percent of funding that goes towards women of color and all of these you know really like discouraging statistics and I actually live in a very like statistic agnostic world (laughs) and some people might consider that like ignorant I think it's a necessity I consider myself like an illogical optimist, which basically means if you, (laughs) but the thing is like, if if you want to be log, I mean, I'm logical to be really clear, but like specifically as it relates to what you pursue and why and how and what you believe is possible, you can't be logical. Logic would tell you that there's a 99.9% chance that you're going to not be able to do this according to the numbers. So why would you pursue it? But like, what? No, 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 no. I'm not going to listen to that. And every single thing that we try to do is hard. Solving climate change, really hard. Way lower odds of being successful, right? So every single, and so many things, being a first, you know, a first generation person to graduate college, being the children of immigrants, being, you know, one of 20 black people to graduate from, to even get into a certain school, like all of the things that we do as people of color and builders of color and entrepreneurs of color, Mm-hmm. and people of color in this country mm-hmm. are beating the odds over and over and over again and mm-hmm. so i have just shed myself of those numbers and i don't think about mm-hmm. them when i operate because that's the constant yes no i agree i would say that i'm also a statistical anomaly in terms of the things i've been able to accomplish and do and mm-hmm. i think and then I, I've learned that for those of us that are able to exist as statistical anomalies and can navigate things like financial markets and building these things, like part of our role and responsibility with acknowledgement of the communities we come from is treading that line. And it's not mm-hmm. easy work, but for those of us who do have that access and can do that, we should do that work and be a little delusional while doing it. So I love everything that you're saying because <laughs> it's like, I I think we've already, you know, beaten some odds to be able to even have this episode right now and talk to each other in this way about what we're building, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a matter of how do we continue to build those support systems. And I think in order, the reason why I think it's really important to bring more BIPOC into climate tech, especially at this time, is because I think from, of course, it's not a monolith, but from my experience, a lot of BIPOC operate in this like more of a mood of giving and redistribution than Mm -hmm. our white counterparts necessarily Mm -hmm. speaking if you're able to create that space and invest in one BIPOC founder I'm sure you're creating the path and the resources in the future networks for tens to hundreds right and so it's one of those interesting it's one of those interesting things where it's like there is also the issue where like maybe you know there have been very wealthy one percent BIPOC who get into that space and don't give back, right? Like that, there's always those stories. But I think there is a lot of us who are community minded and do know that redistribution needs to be at the core at the end of the day of what we're doing to create co benefits with the technologies and the solutions we're building to make sure that communities don't get left behind. And I think Mm -hmm. that is inherent um, in a lot of cultures about generosity, giving, creating reciprocity. And Mm -hmm. if we want to create climate solutions and economies that mirror that, then we need to embody that as well. And in some ways, there is going to be those of us that are kind of like the beginners, like venturing off into that. And it's kind of a bloodbath low key, but it's also like, we're hopefully going to make it easier for other people to enter this space. And because 
the climate crisis is so looming. It's so demanding. We need more people who are thinking about climate tech in a way that is community driven, that is driven by not excluding people out of that conversation and mm-hmm. holding corporations accountable. And mm-hmm. I think what you all are doing at Planet Forward is a perfect case study and example of operating at those intersections, right? Of like being able to beat the odds, being able to have the right allies and people in your corner and building a solution that is scalable and actually is a win-win-win across the board for communities and for the planet. And I think that's just so dope and it's very inspirational. And this, these kind of stories are what give, gives me hope because beating the odds, especially when it comes to the climate crisis, those are the stories that we need. So mm-hmm. I just think what you're doing at Planet Forward truly is a beam of hope in a sea of so much despair that mm-hmm. we have these days. And I just think it's really cool for more people to realize that climate tech can be a space if you're listening to this to thrive, like whether you come yeah. from an engineering background or a data oh, analysis yeah. background or a finance background or comps or marketing, there's a lot of different angles in that industry. There's going to be millions of jobs that are going to be popping up just in this next decade to get involved with building decarbonization technologies. And so if that's of interest to the people listening, please you know, check out Planet Forward, learn from Kylin, learn from all of these amazing accelerators and start plugging into those ecosystems. Because I think if we're able to get more diverse people into those rooms, then they can ask some of those harder questions about where are these funds going? Who is funding it? Why do you even want to fund it? And why is this white dude (laughs) getting this much funding while these like BIPOC who actually have a revenue generating business don't get even a second look, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, mm-hmm. this is another conversation. For another day. <laughs> but, yes. but that's what I'm saying. Like you can be the best. What is it? Like there's so much talent that is untapped in this space. Yeah. And I think that's because a lot of, especially, you know, BIPOC don't even necessarily feel like included in STEM fields to begin it with, right? Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. then when we're thinking about climate tech, expecting um, STEM to climate tech to getting higher education in STEM and climate tech, like all those things, the numbers just go down, 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 down. So -hmm. again, it's also about like, how can we get to people younger, like the younger generation in high school and middle school, who I hope will be listening to this episode to be like, you can start thinking that this could be a career path for you Mm -hmm. and that there is going to be thriving, viable, long-term jobs in this space. And so, yeah, I just think everything you shared was just really inspiring. And I hope people listening to this will, you know, look up to you and want to follow your journey and follow in some of your footsteps as well. And, and reach out. I mean, my biggest regret when I was younger was that I felt like I didn't know enough. I came from a background and a place where I hadn't seen careers modeled before. I didn't know what these terms were and what these, you know, what everyone else was talking about is what I felt. I did felt like I didn't know. And I felt like I I didn't know enough to even know where to start is how I felt. And so I waited longer than I should have to start asking questions and to start having conversations and start talking to people. And again, like back to things that we're unlearning as people of color. I think like learning how to ask for help is one of the biggest ones. And I just encourage people to like start early and often, like shoot your shot over and over and over and over again and fail over and over and over again and have weird, awkward conversations and do whatever it is, but just do it. And don't ever think that there's like, you know, some starting point that you're not at yet because there's not. And if anything, again, back to the odds conversation, we have so much ground to make up that like we have no time to waste. So just go for it. Mm. Yes, thank you. On that note, that was incredible. How can people (laughs) stay in touch with you, learn about what's going on with Planet Forward? Yeah, Yeah. just plug whatever you'd like right now. I mean, absolutely follow me. You'll get my real authentic self, which will hopefully also demonstrate that it's just normal people doing these things. So you can follow me on Instagram. My Instagram is Kaya Solea, K-A-Y-A-S-O-L-E-I-A. My Twitter is Kylin Solea. So my first name, Kylin. And then same spelling. I post everything that I'm doing, whether that be speaking engagements or conferences or initiatives or thoughts related to work on LinkedIn. So also a great place to connect with me. And then follow Planet Forward. Check out our website. 
we're Planet FWD. And and feel free to to start a conversation. Feel free to reach out and say hi. I'm a super approachable, nice human being. And I fully encourage that. Amazing. Well, thank you for offering that resource to my community on here. And we're so grateful to have had you on the show today. And I, yeah, I just appreciate and excited to see how you continue to grow as a leader in the climate tech space, um, making the blueprint for other people to be able to feel like they can thrive in this space too. I know even, you know, the conversations I've had with you as someone who is up and coming in the space has already like made me feel like I'm not completely lost. And so I, yeah, just on a personal level, I think, yeah, just knowing you, I'm, I'm really grateful for it. So thank you. You are 100% on the path and we're on it together. And I can't wait to keep growing and thriving uh, on this journey. So thank you so much for having me. And I can't wait to spend more time soon. Yeah, well, thank you so much for joining this episode of the Brown Girl Green podcast, where I interview environmental leaders and advocates about diversity and inclusion, as well as creative solutions to the climate crisis. I am working to change the image of what it means to be an environmentalist in the 21st century. Make sure that you subscribe and listen to the Brown Girl Green podcast wherever you get your shows, as well as to subscribe to the Brown Girl Green YouTube channel and follow the new Brown Girl Green podcast Instagram at Brown Girl Green podcast. Till next time, catch you later. Thanks, everyone.